Thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody this morning. Um, I'm so happy that so many of you uh, appeared uh, on the second day uh, in the morning in an early hour. Um, this panel serves to fulfill one of the role of this conference is to join uh, to the European discourse on the Conference of the Future of Europe. Uh, the title of the, conf the, the panel itself says a new vision for Europe, uh, where the EU should be heading. And I hope that today with Kathleen Che, with Ivan Vaivoda and Claudia Gamon, who are hopefully uh, with us. Good morning, Ivan, and good morning, Claudia. I can good morning. morning. Yeah, wonderful. Good morning. Very nice to see you, and thank you for joining us from the distance. Um, yesterday we learned that hybrid uh, conference works actually pretty well, so I'm very confident that we'll have a nice discussion this morning. And uh, I also hope that our public will join to this discussion. Um, the Conference of the Future of Europe is supposed to be a um, free deliberation, uh, as I think so. Um, Katalin Che is a member of the European Parliament and Vice President of uh, the Renew Europe Group and also member of the um, panel of the Conference of the Future of Europe or the a delegation of the Conference of the Future of Europe uh, as so as Claudia Gamon who is also a member of the European Parliament representing uh, uh, the Austrian party NEOS, while Katalin is representing the Hungarian Momentum Party uh, in the Liberal Political Group. And uh, Claudia is also a member of the delegation of the future of the uh, on Conference on the Future of Europe. And Ivan Vaivoda is our third guest today, who is a former a Serbian diplomat, currently acting director of the Institute of Human Sciences um, in Vienna. And Ivan is a funder uh, of a research group, a, a program, which is, which is called Futures, Europe's Future. Uh, so Ivan has a, a very interesting oversight on how uh, today's politicians, thinkers, and researchers uh, are thinking about the future of Europe, what problems they see, and what kind of solutions people think about for these programs, for these problems. So I, this is a quite interesting uh, topic, uh, which I believe concerns all of you. So um, maybe just as a start, Claudia, would you please tell three sentences to us about what this uh, Conference on the Future of Europe is about? Well, hello and good morning. I hope you can hear me well. Um, Hello, uh, Kathleen, it's great to see you after the Strasbourg week. So uh, what is the uh, Conference on the Future of Europe? It's many things, but it is supposed to be a very open public debate about the future of Europe and where the European Union should head in its reforms and what reforms those should be. And what makes the Conference on the Future of Europe very different from other uh, similar processes that we've had in the past is that there be that there is and will be a very strong focus on citizens participation so this weekend actually the citizens panels are starting which are made up of, of a a represent representative panel of citizens from across the european union that are debating the same topics that we as as members of national and the european parliament are also debating and then we'll be trying to put all of that together to find uh, suggestions for European reform um, and to do this in a very public way with a very public discourse in plenary sessions in Strasbourg. Thank you very much. Um, the, um, this summer, there were a number of uh, contributions uh, to, to the topic of the conference. And also there were various polls and researches on what people think about the future of Europe and also on how people uh, think about the pandemic, which we all went through in the last one and a half, two years. So the Con European Council of Foreign Relations made 
a large study in 12 EU member countries, uh, which was published a couple of days ago. And this study found that the European project still enjoys a strong support from European citizens. However, many Europeans have a bit less confidence uh, than a couple of years ago in the EU's capacity to act uh, strong and efficient when it's really needed. Uh, the report also said that the shared vulnerability uh, is not enough any longer to bring Europeans together. Uh, and there is a, people, people feel that there is a strong need for reform and the EU should be stronger. Uh, again, this summer, there were a couple of other initiatives uh, discussing or thinking about the future of Europe. For example, 16 um, right-wing parties uh, published a common declaration about how they imagine the future of the European Union. Uh, they were calling for serious reform and they said that the EU should be stronger and therefore member states, nation states, should be stronger within the EU. Uh, one of them, Viktor Orban, made a special advertisement in many European newspapers you might see at where he said that Europe is facing very serious challenges, such as mass migration, epidemics, and pandemics, um, and Europe must secure uh, its citizens' uh, security. And therefore, reform is needed, and Europe should be stronger. So we have a number of um, proposals already, and that and people in the EU feel that e the, the union should be stronger. And there are all kind of politicians and thinkers also believe uh, that the EU needs reform and, um, and should be stronger. So this is what I'd like to talk with you, also including the public, what a stronger Europe means for us. So just again, a little warm up. Um, our three speakers, would you just say like two sentences or two minutes, uh, each of you, uh, what a stronger U Europe means for you? Maybe I call Ivan first so that you can Sorry. also uh, uh, show yourself in the discussion. So what, what a stronger Europe would mean for you? Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Georgia, first of all, for the invitation. And I'm sorry I could not be there in Budapest with you. And I guess with Claudia, we're speaking from Vienna uh, uh, this morning. Um, a, a stronger Europe. I, I think that Europe will in five years be stronger. And despite what the uh, ECFR uh, study showed that vulnerability is not enough, I think that by necessity, with the challenges that the world is facing, whether it's climate change, whether it's the pandemics, whether it's the refugee issue, that won't be going away. That is something that will stay, that the countries, regardless of their orientation, left or right wing or somewhere in the middle, uh, they will have to act. I think there's an illusion with the sovereignist movement that these countries, by being sovereign, can resolve these issues better. I think that is something that will be shown in practice that they cannot, that they will have to rely on each other. That is why the European Union is what it is. It is to confront not only global challenges, but, but local ones. And so obviously the, the, the proof is in, in the making and the capacity as uh, has been said. And I think that will be a big test, but ultimately I, I do not see either the European Union falling apart or becoming weaker, it must, to put it very simply, Europe must grow up to the challenges that it faces. Thank you very much. And now, Katalin, are you an optimist or less optimistic? Uh, will Europe be stronger in, let's say, five, ten years' time than today? Thank you very much, Juja. And uh, is this thing? And uh, first of all, many thanks for having me on this panel, and uh, it's great to see you, Claudia and Ivan. Um, 
So you asked me whether I'm an optimist or not. Well, I think I would not be in Hungarian politics uh, if I would not be an optimist. Uh, so I think this defini uh, by definition uh, sets me on track that I do believe that things will be better, things have to be better. But also, it's not only my optimism saying this. Uh, I believe that Europe's history has shown us that we've always become stronger through crisis. Uh, and if you just look at uh, what's happening now, that how we are working ourselves through this pandemic, uh, we already arrived to points uh, in our uh, joint European project that I think we would never think to be possible. Just even a few years ago, Angela Merkel said that Eurobonds are not possible in her lifetime. And now look at the next generation EU, what, uh, what we have there. Uh, the process that we have made over the past years, uh, I think is very impressive. And uh, also, if we look at how we managed to reform our uh, uh, European own resources, I'm not sure that even if we manage to realize how much of a big step uh, what we've achieved now uh, with the uh, levy on the digital uh, companies uh, or on uh, big polluters that will feed into our uh, joint European budget, how much of a big of a reform this is. We are so much farther ahead uh, in our uh, stronger, stronger and more integrated Europe than just even when I started this mandate. Or look at the rule of law conditionality mechanism, which is like not working perfectly. Not right now, it's not really working even at all. But we have this. Uh, these are so big steps forward that uh, my optimism for the future uh, could not be stronger. And as uh, Mr. Vaivoda said, uh, it's our only chance. If Europe cannot be able to reform itself uh, to an entity that's able to react strong, strongly and uh, quickly to the global challenges we are facing, uh, we won't be able to meet the expectations of our citizens. And I believe that we as responsible politicians uh, we could never let that happen. So I'm full of optimism. Well, this is really good to hear. And uh, Claudia, are you an optimist or not so much? Or a realist? Oh, I'm actually also rather optimistic because I do agree with what Kathleen just said that the, uh, the pandemic has been a catalyst for many changes that we wouldn't have seen possible or wouldn't have thought possible before that. Because once it's necessary, change can happen rather soon if it's absolutely necessary. And I do think that in the past, we had never seen the necessity to really make Europe work for its people. And that is something that I do believe is what people expect. And it's not about whether we, we know, we, whether we see a common vulnerability in, in different uh, parts of the political uh, system and, and different aspects of it but that Europe actually has to deliver, it has to work. And the last year has really shown us parts where it doesn't work, but where we see it much more directly because it affected people so on a much more personal level than it would otherwise. Because oftentimes European politics are very far away from citizens, not in a way that it happens in Brussels and not elsewhere, but because the time that it usually takes for any European law to take effect, to, to actually, be noticed by people where afterwards national politicians can can complain about what has been done in Brussels is usually really long. And in the last year, people were actually rather surprised when it comes to different COVID measures or why is it not being done on the same level on many member states uh, and being coordinated better. People were thinking, how is this not something that's been done on a European level? How is that possible? Because it doesn't make sense. And I think this has been a catalyst for many people to see the advantages of being a stronger Europe in a global world. Because when we act together, we can actually make Europe work better on a day-to-day -day level for its citizens. And I think this is what people expect. Well, it's very nice to, to hear that you are so optimistic and you can demonstrate a couple of uh, significant success from the last few years. Uh, however, and let me be the devil advocate, uh, there are plenty of fields where no success has happened. Uh, in the migration, there is no step forward for at least for five years. Uh, serious challenges like demographic decline in Europe uh, is, is really uh, an issue without uh, much um, efficient step forward. Viktor Orban has an answer to this, but we know that that's, that does not work either. 
uh, the, the climate uh, challenge, uh, uh, democracy, uh, rule of law. I think it's uh, Jean Asseborn also yesterday mentioned one of his key concerns. So uh, isn't that that politicians in Europe today have very different threat perceptions? Uh, and therefore, they uh, and you also formulate uh, your opinion according to what was possible and what not. But actually, there are plenty of things where step forward did not happen. And while analysts agree that traditionally the EU was progressing in each and every crisis, and of course we do see certain steps, as you said, Katalin, definitely. But altogether, uh, the last decade since the um, economic crisis and the migration crisis and the pandemic demonstrated that each crisis creates more divisions uh, than, uh, than cooperation and progress. So what do you think about uh, this, this issue that there are more and more cleavages among not only the member states and certain regions, but also uh, an ideological uh, cleavage within countries is also happening. I mean, Hungary is definitely one example to this, but there are many others. So it's a much more complex uh, issue. And also, if we see uh, forecast what a common foreign policy can be vis-a-vis -vis China, Russia, or the African countries, definitely there is no agreement at all. So my next round of question before we open to the, um, the audience, uh, where do you think there is hope that we can move forward, let's say, in the next 10 years? So, and where do you think uh, the, the progress would be uh, more difficult? Katalin. Well, European integration has always been a struggle. Uh, so I think moving forward is always difficult, right? There are so many different interests, there are so many different perceptions. Uh, as you said, between countries, uh, within countries, between regions. Uh, we are a diverse bunch of people, and I think this is what makes Europe beautiful, of course. Uh, I, I'm an optimist, as I said. Uh, of course, I think that uh, there are some areas uh, where uh, we have to overcome quite a lot of uh, historic baggage to, to deal with. However, I think the challenges of, of today makes it very inevitable to, to even address some of these sensitive questions. And for uh, under which I mean that what we really need and should make progress on, and where progress will be difficult but necessary, is the question of unanimity. The, how, the way how Europe works, the way how member states vote. Uh, and, and I think this is really at the, the heart of a lot of things we discussed earlier. We need to be a more efficient Europe that can work faster, that can react to global challenges uh, in a more uh, rapid and efficient way. And also where, um, where the entire community could not be held hostage by Trojan horses. Uh, if you look at the way how our foreign policy operates right now, there is a very worrying trend that there is this rising uh, global competition with China and Russia. However, these uh, countries uh, now can rely on one of their loyal autocrats uh, inside our community uh, who is very eager to veto anything that uh, uh, he does not like. Uh, and, and, and I think this very destructive and also very dangerous behavior that can uh, put uh, the future of our entire geopolitical strategy into jeopardy really raised a lot of discussion around this question. And I think a few years ago, we would not even imagine to be touched. Uh, so I think where progress should be made, even in a difficult way, it is uh, qualified uh, majority voting, a transition to that. But of course, we need to hear also what the Conference for the Future of Europe thinks about it. Uh, but, but this area is certainly something that I would spot. Another thing, very briefly, is uh, the way how we address the rule of law challenges that arise uh, within our community. I believe we could never be a strong Europe uh, if uh, the foundations upon which this union is based is not respected in every single member state of the union. Uh, we already see that our current toolkit is not enough to, to tackle the challenges what we have. And the rule of law conditionality mechanism is, of course, a big step forward. It needs to be applied. Uh, but also, I 
thing, there are also a lot of other areas which is not covered by this mechanism and, and we need to find a global solution that can create, that can maintain a Europe of values uh, no matter uh, if you live in whatever co corner of, of, of Europe. And by closing, I think these challenges, if not solved, uh, can, can really de derail the entire European project. Uh, because we see, of course, right now problems with one member state or the other. Uh, but let me be clear, it is not a problem of only of those member states, but a problem of the entire community. Uh, we might, and I'm quite hopeful, for instance, that next year Hungarian opposition will be successful at the elections, so that Mr. Orban's vetoes uh, probably would be gone in council. But if other member states see that this is a viable way to move forward, uh, that it is tolerated within the community, then more and more and more member states will get the idea that they can operate in this manner. The backsliding will continue if Europe does not have a global answer uh, for uh, this uh, decline and destructive behavior within the community, then uh, we will see more and more mini Orbans growing up in every single corner of our union. So, so this is, I think, something that we have to tackle uh, so that we can create a strong Europe, a more integrated Europe that works together and uh, not works against uh, its own uh, internal causes for the uh, pursuit of short-term national political victories. Thank you very much. So uh, you believe um, a stronger Europe is a more integrated Europe, and then you demonstrated us a couple of examples uh, where difficulties are ahead to achieve this. So Claudia, what do you think? Um, what are the easy and difficult fields to move on? Um, I don't want to repeat what Catalina said, but one important point that she made also on the rule of law is that I, I very much belief that it is not a standalone issue and I very often see some people saying how uh, why why is it so important also for example for our political group Renew Europe because I believe uh, that the rule of law issue is not standalone because it very much influences the quality of political decisions in all the other fields it is a precursor to making sure that the European Union functions in every way in every decision that we make be it from taxes to climate change to whatever else. So that is why the rule of law question has to be a, a priority to solve that we can really proudly say that Europe is still a Europe of values because those values also guide the decisions that we make in many, many other areas. However, I don't want to be misunderstood because while I am an optimist that things will change for the better, I am I'm also a realist saying that I do think that they will change for the better because the situation right now is actually pretty dire because Europe is not performing well, neither on foreign policy, not on, uh, on climate change policies. We have many, uh, we have great goals that we set for ourselves. However, the way to achieve those goals, I'm not sure whether or not we are on the right track. And many other issues and how competitive the European Union is on a global scale, how competitive we are, how, are, how we're moving forward with trade deals, how can we compete uh, in digital industries. I, I don't think we're doing rather well. And one of the things that's, um, that has to do with that is the way that decisions are made in the European Union. And if we don't use the next decade as a decade of reform for our institutional processes, for the decision making, also for the speed at which decisions are made on the European level, then um, I do fear that after um, more or less losing out on the digital changes and where digital industries are positioned in the world, the next thing that we are at risk of losing out is the green transition and where the heart of the green economy, of the global green economy, will be situated. Because what Silicon Valley was for the uh, United States, I do believe that we as Europe should have the center of green technology, of uh, the green economy, of green job growth in Europe. And I am really, um, I'm really skeptical as to whether or not we see the potential of that, but also the necessity for institutional reforms that are a precursor to making those decisions that lead into that direction. So institutional reforms are hard, but we need a catalyst for change. And I do hope that the Conference on the Future of Europe can be such a catalyst. And I don't think that these decisions nowadays, unlike it was made in the past and the, the whole entire history of the past, 
40 uh, years of, of institutional integration in Europe. Um, I think it will have to go differently this time. It cannot be a top-down approach. It cannot be something that is simply what European um, heads of state want for the European Union. It has to be also a, a bottom-up process that comes from the citizens itself. It has to be something where every citizen in the European Union also sees the value of it. So they, we have to make sure that we lead this debate publicly and with everybody because otherwise it will not be successful. And that is something where I think we still lack in, in, in infrastructure. Because I don't remember there being many public debates about the future of Europe. It's not something that people talk about at their dinner table, unfortunately. And I think that is where we have to get to. Well, thank you very much. So now we, you described also a number of institutional reforms uh, of the European Union and also you mentioned a number of policy fields where there is a, a, a necessity to step forward and also where there is potential and agreement possible. Uh, yesterday um, in the afternoon, one of the afternoon debate, Larry Diamond spoke about um, the state of the world where we are, which is also the truth in, in Europe. And uh, he said that if we don't think linear on history uh, and, and democratic, democracy decline, which we uh, live in and perceive in many countries and all together in the West, then we should think about how to revitalize uh, democracy, how to reshape it, how to formulate. And he said that this should incorporate institutional reform, I mean thinking uh, about the institutions of democracy and and uh, and policies, just as you mentioned, which is also very relevant for the EU. But then he said that we also have to think about ideas and democratic processes, as because democracy is is a is not a, an ever completed project. It's a process, and we have to figure out uh, how to improve it continually and all the time. Uh, Ivad, uh, when you think about what is <coughs> difficulty and what's possible for the future, uh, how you think about ideas and democratic processes uh, beyond the, the concrete policies what um, uh, Katalin and Claudia spoke about? Well, first of all, let me say that I very much agree with what uh, Katalin and Claudia said uh, in, in their uh, interventions, and it's uh, very important that you reminded us not only as the devil's advocate, Georgia, that uh, the challenges are huge. And let me just say, uh, in a sort of sweeping statement, that the evil in history can come back very easily. Uh, not only the, the the prior century was a demonstration of that, but the country where I was born no longer exists, uh, Yugoslavia, that disappeared in front of my eyes, and even though. I was a person of ideas and social science. I didn't see war and conflict and nationalism and sort of the evils of the past coming back like a boomerang. And I think that's what we need to be aware of. That's why Europe was created, to avoid those evils coming back. And I think there's a lot of complacency because Euro uh, Europeans and citizens have gotten used to all the benefits that have in been incurred by uh, the 40, 50, 60 years of, of its existence. You know, open borders, a common currency in many countries, simply the easiness of living the various social rights. And I think that's why people believe that Europe needs to exist because when Trump and Brexit happened, suddenly people realized that all this could slide back into, into different areas. But coming back to, to your question, I think there's been a I don't know how to say it exactly, technicization of politics. We talk about governance very often, not about democracy. Democracy about, is about the people's voice being heard, the relevance of that voice in political uh, decision-making. And I think that what has happened with the rise of right-wing movements or nationalism and populism is that there's been a disenchantment with politics. People feel... Uh, distant from it and they don't see that politicians are responding to their needs. I cannot not mention an example of how politicians are trying to stay in power or come to power. And that is the example of Michel Barnier the other day, 
I mean, somebody who uh, negotiated Brexit on the part of the European Union suddenly in France comes out with a sovereignist speech of the worst kind, and suddenly there's a flip. How, do, how can people believe in politics and then ask who is Michel Barnier? Is he a pro-Europeanist or does he want to be a French sovereignist? And I think these are the kinds of things that people are tackling with when they're looking, as Claudia says, and talking at the dinner table. People need to feel protected. That's key in a democracy. And secondly, they need to feel they have a chance. And if they don't feel they have a chance, then the kind of snake oil solutions, as Americans say, the illusionist illusions are the ones that they are attracted to. And I think that in, in the spirit of democracy, and Larry Diamond, I think, very rightly says, and that's someone uh, like myself who deals in political philosophy, democracy is reinvented every day. It's not given. It's a very fragile flower. And if it's not cultivated in the right way, it can disappear. And the regression of democracy that we're seeing is, I think, a manifestation of that. And that is why this whole rule of law conditionality, that is why our mouths are full uh, of these issues. And Claudia rightly says it, it has much broader ramifications than simply the question of does, uh, is the judiciary independent or not? And if I can add, Zhuzha, because this is about the, the Conference on the Future of Europe, the region where I come from, uh, the Western Balkans, I believe it's been a big mistake on the part of the conference not to include these countries in, uh, in this conference, even though we can send emails and propositions to the conference. But if it's about the future, and if it's about a continent coming together, and you know, one need only mention the Balkan route, where this region was an integral part of the decision-making on how to address the refugee issue, then I think we need to be comprehensive. And what I call this last unintegrated core part of geographic Europe needs to be much more part of these conversations than, the, than uh, has been the case up to now. And I will also underscore, we need to move to qualified majority voting because the strategic relevance of Europe will be lost with our declining demography, which you rightly said, and our aging populations. We will need people coming from other parts of the world to do the jobs. Thank you very much. Well, we have already a set of um, ideas and various kinds. And now I'd like to open the floor and wonder uh, who would like to make a comment or a question. So we start there. Uh, I don't see you, I'm sor sorry, even if I know you, yeah? And then we will continue with you. Uh, yeah, the two questions first. Thank you, Zuzia, thank you for Would the Would you panel. please introduce yourself? Yeah. Uh, my name is Daniel Barta, and uh, thank, you, thank you for the panelists. I would have a question, um, and, and uh, I would answer your, your qu very first question, and what Europe should do and not do. And I think what Europe should do is not let another big citizens or citizens' consultation to fail. I think it's very important. And the question would be for the panelists is what will you do uh, to save the, conf uh, the conference on the future of Europe? And the reason I'm saying it, let me give a very short uh, uh, list of terms, that if you go online, if you go online and check the homepage, official homepage of the conference on the future of Europe, it had so far 100,000 even participants, 40,000 40, endorsement and 7,000 ideas in about five months since it was launched and only a few months left. So if these numbers are correct on the official page, that's very sad because you don't need a group of conservative parties to derail the process. You only need a very small group of far right parties to derail the process. And then they can claim if you dis uh, disregard their opinions that uh, the European Union is, uh, has a huge democratic deficit, it disregards the citizens' opinion, and uh, the big institutions once again had rewrite the, the will of the people. So what will you do in the remaining months to save this process? Thank you. Okay, so please go ahead. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. <coughs> Uh, Ralf Leonhard, I uh, write for the daily paper Tageszeitung Taz in Berlin. Um, I w 
when we speak about the future of Europe, I was a bit surprised that nobody except Ivan at the end uh, indirectly addressed the upcoming expansion of the EU, uh, which may change the character of the Union altogether, uh, taking into account that most of the governments or the ruling parties are much more much closer to Viktor Orban than, say, Angela Merkel and their understanding of politics. Uh, so we may have a Europe in a few years leaning much more to the right and to populist um, mechanisms. Uh, are there any um, mechanisms uh, being elaborated before those countries join? that something like in Poland and Hungary, just for the change of a party in government, uh, democracy can be um, dismantled. And with that, the, the entire Europe European Union. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Very interesting question. So we ha take one more question uh, uh, there, and then I will give the floor to the speakers, and you, you can pick up some of the questions, you don't mm -hmm. have to answer all of them as, as you yes. wish. Good morning, Omar and Rawi. I'm uh, elected member of the City Council of Vienna. Uh, I think one of the challenges we have to deal with the European Union in, in terms of their institutions for the future will be how to implement the rights of regions and cities within this institution. We know we have the parliament, we have the commission, and we have the, the minister council but we know that more than 50% of the citizens in the world are already living in cities. Uh, within 2050, will be maybe two-thirds in the cities. And the, the results and the decisions are taken. Well, there is the, 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 the uh, Auschwitz, the commission of, of the regions. But uh, as a fourth column in, in, in building this European Union would be really, very, very interesting to give the cities the chance to do that. I think that in terms of the future with, uh, with combating nationalism and, uh, and, and trying to, to, to have the people who are in the urban area uh, living, they have, they have to have the chance uh, to, uh, because there's a lot of decisions taken in the European Union that at the end affects the cities, for example, in terms of budget cuts, uh, I don't know what uh, uh, the, the, the stabilization pact uh, there is there's no difference in making if these cities are investing in, in projects of the future, uh, building universities, hospitals, uh, uh, all, all these things that they should be not taken as a debt because there's investment on the other side. And I think this is a big challenge for the future in terms of thinking that a lot of conflicts in the world would be easier solved if the city diplomacy is working. You might see today that Maybe if two prime ministers would, would meet, that would get a, a diplomatic uh, problems. I remember when the foreign minister in Austria invited Putin to her marriage. There was a, a lot of discussions why they're breaking uh, the thing. But on the, the other side, if the mayor of Vienna meets the mayor of Moscow, nobody would say that. And I think there's a big chance that the future concentrating of, of the regions of the cities as one of the important columns. Okay, well, thank you very much. So we have now th three questions. One of the fate of the conference on, on, on enlargement and uh, the, the role and rights of, of cities in the EU in the future. So who is going to start? Would like to comment? Well, if you want, I can start with the, uh, with the question from uh, the gentleman from Tages Zeitung. Um, indeed, the, the whole question of enlargement is about the cred credibility of the European project. Uh, at the highest levels uh, of, uh, of the European Union, and most recently, the visit of Chancellor Merkel to uh, Belgrade and, and Tirana, uh, she has repeated what has been said since the Thessaloniki summit of 2003, when these countries were uh, invited to, to join and uh, provided, of course, they meet the co conditionalities of the Copenhagen criteria. Um, 
I think uh, your worry uh, is a bit overstated because the earliest these countries can come in is probably in 10 years uh, or eight years. And uh, Europe will certainly uh, hopefully address the issue of, of the rule of law in Hungary and, and Poland. And in fact, that is a problem because uh, the various governments, uh, which are at different levels dem from democratic to authoritarian trends, one cannot uh, generalize for, for the six countries that compose the Western Balkans, uh, but they're closely looking at how the European Union, how the key member states are addressing the backsliding of, of democracy. And this is a very serious problem in terms of the credibility of the European project and the credibility of how the European Union and its member states uphold the rule of law and the values-based uh, international system as, as such. And so I would say that it's important to maintain, regardless of the famous fatigue uh, with enlargement, uh, that it is important to maintain the open door policy, to use NATO language, uh, of uh, uh, exceeding, uh, allowing uh, countries to exceed. Uh, of course, I won't delve at all into the issue of, of Ukraine and, and, and these issues, but the European Union must uh, project that space of a democratic family that includes uh, European countries. And just let me add one word on, on this issue of, and maybe we will have a chance, but I'd like to say that it is important that Europe, whether we like the term strategic autonomy or not, we need to find a way in which the defense capacities, uh, security and defense has a much bigger role because again, that's part of what I call the growing up and waking up to the reality that Europe needs to have its own capacities in the defense field much more than has been the case up until now. Thank you very much. Rosalind? Uh, Thank you. Uh, so three topics were raised. Uh, very briefly, uh, I would also like to start with the Western Balkans. So I myself, I'm a very big believer in uh, the necessity of enlargement. I think enlargement is one of the strongest, no, it's this one of the strongest geopolitical uh, area where, where Europe can exert influence. So I, I do believe in enlargement, but the problem is very right that uh, you raised that we need to put our own house in order. And uh, the question of the rule of law, as I said before, it should be really looked at as a generalized problem on like how to solve these issues within our community, not to solve it like in this country or that country, but or how to create a European framework uh, which would not allow uh, for uh, any country, be it new member states, old member states, any member states, to fundamentally divert from uh, those values, uh, those laws that the union was founded upon. So what I mean is a good and well-functioning conditionality mechanism, uh, a European public prosecutor's office. Uh, I would believe that more capacity uh, for uh, Europe to, uh, to have a say in things like media freedom, for instance, uh, judicial independence. Uh, we really have to uh, move away from our current uh, status quo, uh, which just leaves way too much uh, up for political processes happening in one country or the other. It is our joint European interest to, to have a good and well-functioning and solid framework uh, which would guarantee the same uh, rights uh, for, for every European citizen and would create the same uh, um, mm, obligations for every, every, uh, every leadership as well in exchange of membership in this very exclusive and very coveted club. Uh, also, the uh selection process really has to keep the uh standards that were set very high on the agenda and uh, and we must move forward with 
with this internal uh, rule of law consolidation process very quickly. Uh, the question about cities, I uh, very much agree with the problem that was raised in the Regional Development Committee. I'm actually a rapporteur on a report on the future of cities, uh, and I think that we have to change uh, the perception on how Europe looks at local governments and uh, realize the transition that, hap that has happened globally uh, where some cities, some municipalities are sometimes size of a country. Uh, the uh, demographic di uh, divide uh, within a city is sometimes as big as uh, it is within a country. So I think we should have significantly more uh, direct funding revenues uh, that uh, would get to cities from, uh, from Brussels uh, without having to go through the central government, we need to give more power, more weight to cities in terms of diplomacy. Uh, but this is really a challenge that we have to tackle in the very near future. And the Conference for the Future of Europe, um, you know, I have this feeling over the whole process that apart from parliament, I hope, uh, very few institutions are interested in uh, making this conference a success. Uh, it's, and also if you look at the participants, the, the uh, geographic divide is, is, is very, uh, very deep either uh, as well. And uh, <coughs> right now we are indeed in a very difficult trajectory. What we politicians have to do, should do, of course, is to empower people to, to take part, uh, to spread the word, to bring out the message. And uh, then later on, when the, the results are in, not to let it turn into a listening exercise, but, uh, but try to uh, push for real reforms based on the inputs. And, but of course, these inputs have to be representative. So uh, with a low turnout, you are very right. Uh, extreme ideas uh, can take hostage the entire process. Uh, so, so we really have to make the most out of the time what we have and, uh, and then try to... Uh, channel as many inputs in as possible. So also please, if you haven't done so yet, uh, please register at the website and make your voice heard also here. Just uh, before I give the word to Claudia on this, maybe you also would like to comment on this issue. Uh, um, yesterday, again, I'd like to link this discussion to several of the yesterday panels. Uh, and I, I think that uh, we agreed that democracy renewal uh, is, um, is an experiment. So if we regard the, the Conference of the Future of Europe as an experiment, um, the contribution, the, the bottom-up process is, is mirroring the, the top-down process. So as if you say that the commitment from, the, um, from some of the institutions is not very strong, uh, obviously that also reflected uh, from from the bottom up, but as an experiment, uh, isn't that, isn't something really interesting, or can this be an interesting process? Claudia. Ah, okay. Well, um, I will start with the conference, and uh, yes, I do think it is an interesting process, but um, that I don't think that that is the problem. The problem is that. The other institutions, especially at the council, I do believe, and I'm, I'm really trying to make a very cynical observation. We're from the beginning on trying to set up the conference for failure because they were never, uh, they were never keen on it. They didn't want it to happen. It was only the, the parliament and especially also, um, uh, also the Renew Europe group pushing for this conference to happen. And it took us a long time to get it off the ground and the setup is far from optimal. It's very far away from it. Um, the website is basically, uh, is the absolute opposite of user-friendly, uh, you could say, when it comes to making it easier for people to participate online. Um, the setup, when it comes to resources that are allocated to, uh, to, to the infrastructure of bringing people there and so on, it was a constant fight. So you, from the beginning on, I had the impression that um, other um, institutions that are uh, in this conference do not want anything to come over it. But the, the question now is, should the parliament just take it lying down or should we use what we have and try to make the best of it? And that is what we are trying to do. What I'm trying to do as an MEP from Austria is trying to have as many public events as I can, where I also 
um, I take note of everything. I put everything on the platform. That is that is what I can do in terms of bringing people to the conference, bringing them to the platform and engaging with them. But the, the big debate I think will have to happen on a on a content level we need to have something to fight about so we need to start not only talking about the conference itself because that is probably the most boring aspect of the entire exercise but to have an actual question where we can fight about as a public on the in a public sphere in the public media and um, all across europe and um I do hope that uh, media institutions all over Europe will participate in that and will uh, take on the fight and have these debates, pro and cons, on the big questions on uh, European integration, on reform, not just of the institutions, but on the big questions of where do we need more, where do we need less, um, on, on the big fights on taxes, for example, on the big fights on foreign policy. We have to debate it publicly. And I do think that the most important forum for that will not be in Strasbourg, it will be the public sphere. And, but we have to get that going. And for that, I think we need to start by having a big question to fight about. And that I hope will we'll start with the next um, plenary session that we will have in Strasbourg to keep it, to uh, just get it rolling and then have a public debate um, and it has to, I think it has to be something provocative or where we can get the, 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 the leadership of Europe, especially in the council to make a statement on where they stand on these issues. And then I think the, the conference can be a success. On the question of, um, just very quickly on the question um, on the cities in Europe, I, I very much agree with what uh, Katalin has said, but I also think that we have to acknowledge the divide between uh, that is happening all over Europe between those living in cities and those that do not. Me coming from a very rural area, um, there there are different um, there are different needs. But I think in the past, uh, just as we have tried to make it to make Europe work for different member states, even though they are very different in terms of their history, their demographics, their geography, we have to acknowledge also the differences that are uh, between rural and, and the non-rural areas all over Europe where people living in cities have very similar lives across the European Union and differ very much when it comes to their to the lives and infrastructure needs and so on uh, to their uh, countrymen and countrywomen in, in more rural areas in their cities. And European policy will have to reflect that because it will make the policy making better, I believe. Thank you very much. Uh, are there other questions or comments from the audience? Uh, yes, I have one here and then another one in the back. Okay, we'll start there because the microphone is there. So we, please. Thank you. Uh, Shimon Gergely Chesser from the European Green Party. Uh, thank you for this very interesting panel. What I wanted to ask is um, in the context of the conference on the future of Europe, is there any proposals from the liberal political family on changing or expanding the competences of the EU in the social policy area? Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, we have another question here in the front. Yeah, well, my name is Istvan Hegedus. I'm the chairman of the Hungarian Europe Society. My question is about the Hungarian elections next year. And uh, I think it's very much related to the topic what you have already discussed. Uh, namely, I, I don't know whether the opposition, the so-called united opposition, including momentum, would try to focus on European issues this time during the campaign. I mean, there is a real cleavage, as we all know, between the government and the opposition regarding the EU as a whole. And uh, the rhetoric of the Hungarian government is very often very hostile against so-called Brussels. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, first of all, a strategic one, whether it has a sense to emphasize this cleavage during the campaign, whether it would be beneficial for the opposition to, to raise this issue and even to sharpen this sort of extreme polarization regarding the uh, relation of Hungary and the region to, to Europe. And my, it's related to the second point, whether such a uh, cleavage would, uh, would bring in to Hungary, again, the issue of the EU, a sort of Europeanization as a mission for the future 
whether the opposition and momentum would like to emphasize this for the future of Hungary and for the future of Europe, uh, the issue of Europe to Europeanize a national election this time. Okay, any other? Yes, please, here. Peter, here we have a, a contributor. My name is Dalma Bairo, and um, my, I want to refer a little bit to uh, what Ivan said about securing uh, defense capacity in Europe is necessary. Um, my question is that um, um, how much Renew Europe focus on the digitalization or art, uh, artificial intelligence special for military use and uh, killer robots and uh, drones and other uh, weapons. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other comment, question? If not, then this is going to be our uh, last uh, round for all the speakers. So uh, please, when you respond to one or the other question on all of them, also kind of conclude your comments on, on whether um, your, my first question, whether what strengths, what, what strengths of Europe, uh, what will bring Europe to be stronger uh, in your opinion? Please, uh, maybe we start with uh, Claudia now, if you don't mind. Hmm? Yes, very much. I was just writing down what everybody was asking. Um, I will start with, um, I didn't quite understand the last question I have to say with digitalization for uh, military use. Um, I'm trying to piece together what I believe the question is about. Um, Why don't we just clarify this? Because I think, uh, Dharma, could you please formulate your question again? Because it was not very clear uh, for the speakers. What exactly your question? Um, there is a, a development going on in the military um, 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 military field, a special focus on uh, artificial intelligence using for military. Um, it means that um, <coughs> they're developing drones and tanks and uh, um, airplanes without uh, meaningful human control. So they're doing uh, self uh, by algorithm who will be die and kill. And this development going on uh, very rapidly all over the world, including yeah. Europe. And what's the question? Because the question I think that is, is that in <coughs> Europe dealing with this issue, um, the militarization and, uh, and uh, um, special focus on artificial intelligence. Whether you, the EU should support this process and participate in it or? Is yes, and a special Renew Europe as a group. The Renew Europe, okay, thank yeah. you very much. Okay, so the Claudia, it's for you. Um, okay, well, I am not an ex expert on military policy, but I do deal a lot with digitalization issues. And what your, your, uh, Renew actually really believes in when it comes to artificial intelligence is that while we very much believe in the potential for AI technology and that we have to invest a lot more in Europe, especially in the, in the competences that we have, we do believe that we need to have a clear regulatory framework for artificial intelligence in order for it to guarantee that it supports human rights, it supports democracy, it is not discriminatory. And for that, we are actually pushing forward for Europe to become the first continent that has a clear regulatory framework for that. And obviously that would also apply to, I guess, all of the military use that is possible for that. And I think that especially here, Europe as, uh, or the European Union, as uh, the place where human rights are put at the center of the heart of any policy, it will have to be especially important. And while I do believe in, in, in stronger military cooperation, but the point where I believe that we have to talk about digitalization and military cooperation is cybersecurity and to protect Europe against cyber threats. And that is where we actually lack a lot. And I 
once again, I'm not an expert, but I, the, the question that I hear a lot when it comes to digitalization in military is more about cyber warfare than it ever is about drones, because that is for Europe a huge threat that we have to deal with. And we're trying to build our capacities in that regard. But I can, I can assure you our position on artificial intelligence is to make sure that it works for uh, humans and not against it. That is what we want to make sure. And I think that this is also the position that the European Union should take in that. Um, the next question um, was about, um, I, obviously I will not uh, comment on Hungarian politics, but on, on social policies. Um, I don't think it's uh, it's a big surprise that uh, some uh, some uh, political families very often differ on some issues and social policies is one of that. Uh, my personal opinion and that of my party is that I believe in the goal of any European uh, European debate has in the end to have a strong uh, United States of Europe. I very much believe in that. And for me, that includes social issues as well, where it makes sense. But that is the point about, uh, about subsidiarity is that everything should always be done on the level where it makes the most sense. And that happens, that doesn't happen for a lot of uh, policy issues in the European Union. So I am, I am neither dogmatic nor ideological about where politics should be made. I think the decisions have to be taken where they work best and where they make the most sense. And um, a final comment, I, believe that the strength of the European Union and the, the success of the European projects in the future will also lie in strengthening uh, European regions. And I think that is something that is very fascinating every time for, um, from the Austrian perspective is the success that Austria has had because we have such strong connections to our neighbors and that we can make the most of the regions where Europe really comes alive, where people work together across border and see what they have in common uh, because of, uh, of the way that Europe brings them together and that the European Union allows them to work more closely together. And if we bring that spirit that many people that live in border regions, for example, if we bring that spirit to the political decision-making processes in the European Union, then I'm very hopeful that the European project will be even more successful in the future. Thank you very much. So, Katalin, um, what do you answer to the questions? Uh, I think Claudia gave a very good answer to the uh, question regarding AI and military. I fully agree with her on this. Um, regarding social uh, policy and the, the conference, well, first of all, I believe that uh, the starting point uh, for us is that everything is on the table. So of course it depends on what the citizens' inputs will 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 show. But uh, me personally, uh, I personally believe that we cannot be a strong and successful Europe if social divisions are as deep between countries as they are now. That uh, in one country, uh, people, uh, some people cannot even afford to have. I don't know, proper heating in the winter and they have to heat with the diapers and trash and at the other end of Europe, uh, uh, iPads are handed out in kindergarten. So, so big social tensions really tear a community apart. So I would believe in a, a stronger integrated and more social Europe with uh, more uh, European com uh, competences in social policies. But as I said, the conference is mostly about listening to input. So uh, political input is only one input and, uh, and, and the most important input hopefully will get out at the citizens level. Um, but I, I, I do think that we, that a lot of the problems we face now in Europe is due to the uh, disregarded social uh, divisions between East and West and North and South. And, and this is our joint interest to create a Europe where, where uh, everybody is able to live a uh, prosperous and safe and socially protected life wherever uh, they, they live within the Union. And, and, and finally, the question regarding the elections and the uh, role of Europe in the elections. Well, of course, I'm biased here, but 
I definitely think that it has to be high up on the agenda and for my party, momentum, it has always been one of the priorities. And not, also, not only because there is a campaign, but this is the future of our country. Uh, whether we want to be in the periphery of a disintegrated and weak Europe of nation states where we fight with our neighbors and uh, where we just like step on each other's feet and the, the word just passes us very fast. Because this is the Europe, uh, what, what Orban wants. Uh, a Europe of the past, a Europe of tensions, a Europe of divisions. And I believe a successful Hungary and also a successful Europe uh, has to go the other way towards more integration, more cooperation. And, and we Hungarians, we have to be the heart of this uh, cooperative project. We need to introduce the Euro. We need to introduce the uh, European Public Prosecutor's Agency also within our borders. Uh, we want to be the drivers of change and uh, not the blockers of it. And I also think that we Hungarians have a particular responsibility in Europe. Uh, we were the ones where the illiberal decline started, so we have to be the ones to stop it, also for the sake of the uh, entire union, but also for the sake of our own country. And uh, to conclude, I, I, I think this is really the big question we face in Europe. Uh, stronger together or weaker when separated? And for me, uh, there is only one answer to this question, an ever closer union, as <laughs> it's so often said. And I have to say that we Hungarians uh, have a very big chance at our hands right now to change the trajectory of our country next April, and also to change the trajectory in which this country participates in European debates and discussions. And I hope that starting next April, we will not be on the destructive side, but we will be uh, a part of that group that cons uh, constructs a strong and prosperous and global and geopolitical Europe. Thank you very much. And finally, Ivan, your final word. Yeah, thank you. Uh, on, on, on social Europe, again, uh, not to repeat uh, uh, Claudia's and, and Kathleen's word, but this is essential. We must remind ourselves that the whole democratic uh, tradition that we stand on is that of the Enlightenment and of the modern democratic revolutions, liberté, égalité, fraternité, and equality, social equality, or the chances for social equality have been fundamental. It, people feel that they are not entitled to a decent life where they can provide the minimum for their families and more, then the European project is really not doing what it is supposed to do. So a strong social Europe is fundamental uh, to go against the right-wing populist nationalist uh, policies that are rearing their ugly head uh, in, in front of us. Uh, on, on Istvan's question, obviously, uh, Katalin replied to that, but let me look at the broader framework because I also cannot comment directly on, on Hungarian politics. I mean, take, take the example of Emmanuel Macron Whatever we think of him, he won the election in 2017 on a strongly pro-European and strongly optimistic uh, ticket. And I think that is a rule book that uh, many progressive forward-leaning pro-European politicians should take their cue and not shy away from uh, doing that, regardless of all the difficulties. And God knows there are many in Europe and, and the very... Uh, various ways in which European politicians are shunning difficult decisions, and that is what we have been talking about here. So I think that that is a good proposition to, to have a strong uh, European argument when one goes forward and to remind people what we have thanks to the European uh, construction. Uh, Clearly, the Hungarian election will be one that will be very carefully watched for all the reasons that have been mentioned. And finally, the German election is crucial uh, to uh, the future of Europe. Um, uh, Zsuzsa, you had asked also in your written paper, you know, who, who decides here? Well, you know, we have to be realist. It's the Franco-German couple that decides many things about how things go, but it doesn't work if those bigger countries do not bring in the so-called smaller countries and all the member states, in fact. The European Union works if everyone is concerned and feels involved. And thus the uh, future uh, traje tra trajectory 
of, of the uh, government that will come in Berlin after the, the September elections will be crucial to that. And I think that the Franco-German couple needs to find whatever their difficulties, and there's no ideal couple, of course, not even in, in politics, uh, let alone in personal life, that needs to define these, uh, these, um, these directions. And last but not least, Europe needs to be much more strategic, not only in its thinking, but in its doing as well. Well, thank you very much. I just realized that at the chat box, so there are people watching this panel online and I didn't see their comments. So maybe the organizers could copy so that we can integrate those comments into the report because we are going to make a report of this panel and we will put them on the website of the conference on the future of Europe. So that's going to be a contribution uh, with all your comments, questions, uh, worries and promises. And uh, I would like to conclude this, this panel. I think this is an ongoing uh, debate and discourse. And uh, as the discussion demonstrated, there are a lot more open questions than, than concluded questions, which also invites everyone here uh, and uh, in Hungary and in, in Europe to think about all these questions, whether this is institutional or on ideas. Uh, because this is a world uh, we live in, this is our future, this is our in environment, and um, I, we, we have to move on together uh, with all of you. So thank you very much for Katalin, for Ivan and Claudia to be with us. Thank you very much for your comment questions and your attention, and enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you.